welcome everybody. It is great to see you guys. Glad you're here. Did you whistle at me? Did you whistle at me, Ray? <laughs> it's good to be with y'all. Uh, tonight, our message is going to be on the power of reconciliation. Let me jump in. I want to give God praise for something. We Tonight is the official deadline to apply for summer mission projects. And right now, it looks like there are about 20 of you in the room who've, who are going to get your applications done in time um, and be able to be part of that process. And that I, if I've counted right, that's the most ever summer missionaries that we've ever had from our group right here. So praise God for that. How cool is that? And... Technically, the deadline to apply is like midnight tonight, so if you're sitting here and you're like, I forgot to apply, you get leave now and fill out the application now, because you've got three hours. So, praise God for that. Uh, our message tonight, the power of forgiveness and reconciliation, um, and here's the big idea, is that the fruit of a true relationship with God is a forgiving heart. And when God transforms our heart and he forgives our sin, then it frees us to forgive other people and to reconcile and mend broken relationships. And one thing that is more true and obvious when we look at the world than anything else is that the world is broken. The world is divided. The world is not the way that deep down we know it ought to be. And so we share, when we share the gospel with people, we use the, the little, the three circles illustration. And in that illustration, we talk about God's design for the world. We talk about Jesus, but we make this point about how the world is broken. And anytime I share that illustration with somebody who, who doesn't know Christ, that point resonates so strongly. Because you look at the world and you see politics so divided and so broken. You look at families so many broken families. You look at relationships in your own life, so much human division. And if there's anything that's true, it's that this world isn't the way God created it to be. But praise God when he saves us, and one day he's going to make this world right again. But in the meantime, we get to be part of his plan of reconciliation by reconciling with others when we sin and when they sin. It's this awesome picture of the gospel from us as Christians to a world that needs that message. So to jump in tonight, I want to tell you, I haven't done this this semester about my family, a little about my immediate family. So I brought a photo to show you guys. So this is the Stidham clan. Um, my wife, Teresa, many of you know Teresa because she works here too. Uh, but Teresa and I met in college in campus ministry as freshmen. Uh, we knew each other a little bit freshman, sophomore year. By junior year, we had become very good friends, started dating senior year, um, got married a year after graduation, um, and now we got two kids, so that's our story. Teresa worked in accounting for a while until our kids were born, uh, and then was a stay-at-home mom, and when they started to school, she's been working here as our financial assistant, financial administrator for about 11 years now on our BSM staff team. So that's Teresa. I love that woman more than anyone or anything in this world. And, I, and we're 20, almost 22 years closing in on it, and I respect her, and I have more respect for her and more attraction to her than I did 23 years ago when we started dating. So I love you, babe. You're, you're beautiful. So that's Teresa. Next to her is Josh. He's the big one. Uh, Josh is a junior in the Arlington AH. Uh, Arlington ISD STEM Academy, which means he goes to Martin High School in the mornings, and in the afternoon, he actually comes to UTA as a dual enrollment student. So if you see the kid and you're like, that guy looks kind of young, and he walks into my office and he's got a huge backpack, that's Josh. Josh is a typical firstborn. He's very responsible, very studious, pretty serious. He'll laugh sometimes, but it's got to be a good joke for him to laugh. Um, but he's like a typical firstborn. And then there's Ben. Ben's the little guy. And Ben is the youngest. Ben is the baby. Ben has, I would say, may, maybe the only, but for sure the best sense of humor in our family. <laughs> He's hysterical. He can be shy for about three minutes until you get him to talk. And then it is, you do not know what is going to come out of that kid's mouth. <laughs> And so he's young, he's funny, and also for tonight's purposes, he is like the devil. Okay? So let me explain. So Teresa and I, even though 22 years married, 
we still, we still love each other. We still flirt with each other. We still go on dates together. We still cook dinner in the kitchen together and usually an arm around each other, an embrace of each other. And for some reason, about three years ago, this little kid, so the big one walks in and he sees us with arms around each other and he goes gross and walks out. <laughs> Every, he doesn't want to see it. The little one walks in and his response is very different because he sees his two parents who love each other and are supposed to love each other more than they love anything else. And he says, I have to break this up. <laughs> and about three years ago, he started this thing where he could get a running start and dive. Like, you know, you dive in the pool with your hands out and he could dive in between us and throw himself like a wedge in between us and then spread it out like this. And, and then he yells every single time chaperone <laughs> out his mouth You're like son get lost and he's, like, and he's pushing and then he'll he'll leave and then we'll we'll be like oh he's gone come here and then he just he flies around the corner like he has radar and he knows and he wedges in between and he pushes across and this is what he says chaperone every single time and here's the point christians are supposed to love one another and the devil is always trying to throw himself in between two people who are supposed to love each other more than they love anybody else in the world. That's what the body of Christ should be like, is believers united in love. And the devil wants to divide us and destroy God's church. And he's really a sweet kid. <laughs> but the devil really wants to cause bitterness and a lack of forgiveness, and he wants to divide brothers and sisters from each other so the gospel's progress will halt. So tonight's lesson is on forgiveness and reconciliation. So what we're going to do is a short Bible study in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 25, take it about a verse at a time, and we'll, just, we'll read a verse and we'll say what it says. So Ephesians 4.25, Apostle Paul writing says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. That first phrase, speak truthfully, it's, a, it's an imperative. It's a command. And here's what it is. It says, when you have a conflict with a brother or sister, you got to deal with it. When God commands us, to speak truthfully, to take initiative, to throw off falsehood and pretense whenever we say, yeah, we're okay when we're really not okay. That is not truthful. And he says, in conflict, you need to speak truthfully, put off falsehood, and love your neighbor. Love your brother, love your sister. To not deal with conflict between two believers is disobedience to the scriptures. So deal with your conflict. And that next phrase, he says, for we are all members of one body. The goal, the picture, is a unified church. One body, many parts, but one cohesive body. Um, does the church have a reputation for being united or divided? divided? Divided. And why is the church divided? The first answer that probably comes to your mind is because there's so many denominations. Right? We got the Baptists and then right here's the Church of Christ and the Methodists are there and the Cornerstone's there and the Lutherans and they were all so divided. And here's what I want to say. That's an excuse. Because truthfully, I love the Methodists. Okay? Do, you, do y'all know who runs them? Have y'all ever met Thomas? Thomas runs the Methodist Center on our campus. Thomas actually used to be part of our BSM ministry. He played guitar on this stage. He met his sweet wife Eden who just had a baby in this room. And we love the Methodists. We love the Lutherans, the Cornerstone. I've known their pastors and leadership for 16 years. We love the Cornerstone. The biggest source of division in the church is not churches divided with each, among each other. It's churches divided within themselves. And so I've never met a person. Actually, I'll tell you a story. I was out last Friday with Steve Bissot. Is Steve in the room somewhere? There's Steve. And we were, we were doing evangelism on campus. And we had a couple of conversations. We talked to this couple of social work 
people. And this one guy said, I used to be part of one of the ministries, but I'm not really part of it now. And my big problem is that none of the Christian groups on campus get together. And I was, a, I was ready to pounce, right? <laughs> and I said, well, why do you say that? And he's like, well, they never do any events together and they don't really care about each other. And I said, well, actually yesterday morning, I spent an hour praying with the leaders of Focus, the Wesley Center, the Cornerstone, trying to think ISI. There's like eight ministries on our campus who love Jesus. And every week, the leaders of those ministries sit down together and pray for each other. Not to, hum, not to brag about our ministries, but to pray for our families and each of our walks with God. And so I said that to him. We actually do love each other. And he said, you never do anything together. I said, well, actually, we just had the big howdy party. Did y'all go to the big howdy party? Some of y'all went. So actually, two weeks before, we had just thrown a huge party together. And we do that at least twice a year. And sometimes we put up a big prayer tent. We spend a whole week doing stuff together because we're not divided, because we're all in Christ. But sometimes in our church, we sit in the same rooms, but we're not united with each other. Because we have petty squabbles, we have broken friendships, we have bitterness that's taken root. You have people who have left a church, not because the church was divided Baptist against Methodist, but because they got divided with a person in the church. I've never in my life met somebody who said, I thought about becoming a Christian and I got really, really, really close. But then I realized the Presbyterians had, el their churches had elders and the Baptist churches took a vote on things. And I said, I just can't follow Jesus. But I've met tons of people who've gone to churches and they've said, I went, but the people didn't seem loving. I went and the people treated me badly. I went and it just seemed like something was off with the people in that church. Our, we want to say to people in other ministries, we love them and all of us who are in Christ are united. But the best way we can project Jesus to the world is by dealing with the stuff that's between us and making it right. So here's what he says. We're all members of one body. Every one of you in this room, every person at your church together, we're all members of one body. Let's keep going. Verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Here's some clear instruction. When you got a problem with somebody, deal with it quickly. Don't deal with it in a week or a month or a year. Some of you are like, yeah, I need to make things right with a friend who I hurt in high school. And, he's, and, and the word of God says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it quickly. Because when we do that, what does it do? It gives the devil a foothold. Some people think believing in the devil is superstition and it's old fashioned and he's a myth. Some people believe in wrestling, but they think the devil's fake. <laughs> wrestling is not real. But there's more evidence that evil, pure evil exists and influences our world than any piece of reality. And he is crouching and he is real and he's invisible and he wants to destroy the work of Christ. And the devil's two biggest strategies in a group like ours, I've watched a, this group for a long time. The devil's two biggest strategies is sexual immorality, sexual impurity, sexual sin, and disunity. And if you want to fight for your soul, then you fight in those two areas. So let's keep going. Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get this point. This is important. What grieves the Spirit of God? Unwholesome talk coming out of our mouths, putting each other down, tearing each other up. Grieves the Spirit of God. If you want to grow in your relationship with Christ, you have to pursue forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, sometimes we were talking earlier about how we think that 
Christian unity is about churches being divided. Really, Christian unity is about how you get along with your roommate. When they don't do the dishes, and the food starts to smell bad because they didn't do the dishes, so you do the dishes, and then you hold a grudge. And you don't deal with it, and then they don't get a chance to deal with it. And all of a sudden, you're mad, and you're talking about them to other people, right? And the spirit is grieved. And here's, here's the truth that comes out of that line. Deal with your conflict or it hurts your relationship with God. Because if you're divided from your brother or sister and you have anger at them and God loves them and you're angry at them. You follow me? God loves them and you're angry at them. That affects your relationship with God. You know, you could insult me. You could look and you say, Gary, you're not very tall. I'm not. You could say you have no hair at all. You tuck in your shirts and that's what old men do. They tuck in their shirts. You could insult me all day long. You could insult Republicans or Democrats. I don't care. You could insult football. I don't care. You could, you could, insu you could insult country music. I don't care. Any type of music. I don't care. But if you insult my wife, then you, you will say that short man with no hair and no muscles, you will see my fists clench and my muscles get bigger all of a sudden because if you've got a problem with her, you've got a problem with me. And the church is the bride of Christ. You know, sometimes Teresa will give, do self-deprecating talk. She'll say, oh, I'm dumb for doing that or, oh, I wish I, you know, whatever. And I'll say, you're going to stop that right now because you're talking about my wife. <laughs> and I get defensive again. And I point a finger at her and say, you're, gonna, you're not going to talk about my wife. And it is, she is my wife, so it's ironic. <laughs> and Jesus looks at his church and he says, your roommate who's, who's saved, the person at your church who you're annoyed with, the person who you've insulted is loved by me. And if you have a problem with them, we have a problem. And because Jesus loves his church, he wants us unified. And if you know somebody has something against you, deal with it because you don't want their soul in jeopardy because they've got bitterness against you. So deal with your, deal with your stuff. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells you to get up and leave church. You remember that story? He says, if any of you is there to worship, with your gift at the altar. And you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Then leave your gift at the altar. Get up, go find your brother and sister, make it right with them, and then come back to church. Don't even pretend to raise your hands in worship and say everything's good between me and you, God, whenever things aren't good between you and children, other children of God. That ain't me saying that, that's Jesus. So take it up with him if you don't like it. Jesus says... To worship wholeheartedly. Deal with, what, deal with the conflict you have with other Christians. So let's keep going. It's going to get more practical. Verse 31 says, get rid of bitterness. Ever known a bitter person? Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Y'all, bitterness can cause... People to do things they'd never imagine they would do. I've seen bitterness drive a wedge between family members who went decades unreconciled and not speaking so long that they couldn't remember what they were bitter about to begin with. Bitterness is awful. Once when I was in college, I was hiking and I fell and scraped my leg up pretty bad and I just barely cleaned it and we kept going and it got infected because I left a piece like a big splinter in the back of my leg. And about two weeks later, it got worse and worse and worse and inflamed and inflamed and inflamed. And because I was 19 and stupid and had no money, I took tweezers and I took, and I got it out myself. I got the, the, the problem out of my body and immediately it healed and was better. And unforgiveness is like a wound that's infected and needs to be cleaned out. And once it's cleaned out, it can heal. And some of you are like, I can't deal with it. But if you don't deal with it, it won't get better. And if you do, it will. So, verse 32. 
Last verse. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving just, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. We have a role model for forgiveness. Jesus Christ himself. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many of us in this room are sinners? Is it 50%, 75%, 85%? Okay. I see, I see those hands. I see those hands. 100%. We're all sinners. Next question. How perfect is God? 50% perfect? 90% perfect? How often does he mess up? How impure is he? Holy and pure and per 150% perfect. That's funny. He's pure and perfect. When we hurt, when, when we sin against God, the offense is completely one-sided. In every conflict, human conflict, there's never one party completely at fault and one completely innocent. It's always two sinners. One may have initiated the conflict, but every time I've been sinned against, I sin back, maybe even in my heart. But with God, He's perfect, and we have nothing to forgive against Him, and He has everything to forgive against us. And instead of giving us what we deserve, He sent Jesus, the sinless, perfect substitute, God in human flesh on earth, to die for our sins. And so we have a role model. We, we can absorb offense. Because Jesus absorbed all of our offense. We can forgive because Jesus forgave all of our sins. So if you're in the room and you're not yet a Christian, you should become one. You should just, because Jesus loves you so much and he wants to reconcile you to God. Because there's a tension between you and God. And Jesus provides a way for your sin to be forgiven. You surrender your life to him. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to follow you. I want to turn my life over to you. And the Bible says God forgives you on account of Jesus. If you're a Christian in the room, then I want you to look to Jesus as your role model for how to forgive. Forgive so you can grow spiritually. Forgive so you can be a witness to others because a lack of forgiveness is a bad witness. Forgive because Jesus forgave. Uh, to close out, I want to share a little resource with you. This is a handout I wrote a few years ago called Conflict and Forgiveness. And we actually keep copies of it in the, bl the black bins over there near my office door. There's a ton of resources there. And if you're, if you're ever like, I've got a Bible question, there might be a cool handout over there to answer your question. And one's called Conflict and Forgiveness. It's a practical guide on how to do reconciliation with people. Does that make sense? And some of you are like, where'd you get this material? Well, for years, Teresa and I have met with engaged couples to do pre-marriage counseling. So I'm about to share pre-marriage counseling with all of y'all. But it's really good stuff on how to reconcile relationships. So uh, just a couple of points I want to share off this training handout. How to. Because some of you are saying, I don't want to, but I know I need to, and I'm scared to. And I get it. You love Jesus, but you hate conflict. Let's talk about how. So here's one. Conflict is inevitable. If you hate conflict, you're going to have to get over it. Because if you can't deal with conflict, marriage is going to stink. Your first job and all the jobs that you get after you get fired from your first job are going to stink. Conflict is inevitable when you deal with other people. So Christians must be committed to resolving conflict and pursuing forgiveness. We just have to. Here's a second point that's really good. Give others the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes we, we think said that. And we attribute motive. Think the best of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't jump to conclusions. Let respect be the default at your church, let respect be the default with your roommates. Let it be the default in this group. Um, a practical path to resolving conflict. Here's a few quick steps you can go through. First, if somebody has offended you, examine the conflict. Some conflicts don't even need to be addressed because they're too small. If your roommate leaves one dirty fork out one time, you probably don't need a big confrontation. But if they leave nasty dishes out all the time, you're going to have to talk about it. So just 
Determine if the conflict requires confrontation. Number two, consider your contribution to the conflict. There's never a hundred person who's a hundred percent to blame. There's always wrong on both sides. And even if you didn't initiate the wrong, maybe even just the attitude of your heart was wrong, but own your part of the conflict and be ready to admit that and ask for forgiveness for that. Another one is examine your heart. We never address conflict face to face and boldly if we're trying to retaliate or if we're trying to punish. We only address conflict with the goal of restoring and pursuing peace. Next one is remember that the person you're dealing with is your brother or sister in Christ, not your enemy. The devil's your enemy. He wants you to think they're your enemy. And then the fifth one, fifth one is if necessary, humbly seek forgiveness. You want me to tell you how seeking forgiveness works? This is the conversation I have with my wife too often. Teresa, I realize I messed up and I did this and I name what I did that I know was wrong. Tell me how that hurt you and anything else I did that hurt you. And then I listen. And then I just name it and say, I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have done that. Will you forgive me for doing that? I don't want to do that anymore. And I ask specifically for forgiveness. And she grants forgiveness. And I feel the gospel applied to real life free me from the weight of that sin. And it's beautiful. I have to do it a lot. <laughs> Last thing, little box here, focus on. And if you're like, this is pretty good stuff, it's on the BSM website and it's in that box right over there. Focus on one issue at a time. If you've got this long list of problems with your friend and you say, hey, can we talk? Because there's 12 things you're doing all the time and I don't like it. Focus on one issue at a time. Deal with one issue, then be friends again. And then deal with another issue at another time. One issue at a time, not many issues. Focus on I statements, not you statements. Because the... What happens when you hear the word you? You immediately say, whoa, and you get ready to fight. You get defensive when you hear the word you. So instead you say things like, when this happened, it frustrated me. When this happened, I was really hurt. You don't say you did this and you were wrong. You say, I felt this way when it happened. Talk about specifics, not generalizations. Specifics are yesterday, this happened. Generalizations are you always do this or you never do that. If you want to reconcile, you deal with specific situations, not broad characterizations. Focus on the facts of what happened, not the judgments of motive. Focus on the problem, not the person. Focus on gaining understanding so you can reconcile don't focus on winning or losing. Is that good enough stuff? So here's how I want to close this out. Is I want to ask you what your response needs to be. Some of you are thinking there's somebody that I need to reconcile with. Some of you, we could have had you come up and share a testimony because you had this broken relationship, but you haven't done anything about it. You're like, well, I forgave them, but we still never talk to each other. And maybe you know who that is and there's something you need to do this week to go make a broken relationship right. Maybe when we sing this last song, you could say, God, I'm going to surrender that to you. Help me make that right. How have you handled forgiveness in the past? Maybe today is you just drawing a line in the sand and say, God, I want to do better and I want to handle things better in the future. So what does God want you to do with tonight's word? Maybe you're here and you're not yet a Christian. And during the song, you just want to say, Jesus, I surrender because I need your forgiveness so I can be reconciled. So whatever your response is, I'm going to invite you to, as we sing, just to pray that as your response to God. So I'm going to invite Ben um, up to lead us in a closing song. If Ben's there, there's Ben. Okay. So let me pray for y'all.